Maddie, as people are coming into the webinar, would you give me a little bit of background on Earth Island and what you guys do? Yeah, sure. So the Earth Island Institute, we are a nonprofit environmental group. Uh, we were founded in 1982 by David Brower. Um, we, our main office is in Berkeley, California, although we have lots of projects that are located elsewhere in the country um, and internationally as well. We support, so the, the Earth Island Institute supports activism around in all sorts of environmental issues and through fiscal sponsorship, uh, we provide the administrative and sort of organizational infrastructure for grassroots projects. Um, so what kind of other institutes do you partner with typically? Yeah, so we partner, well, the th beautiful thing about Earth Island is we actually have 80, uh, around 80 projects beneath us. So we are sort of a umbrella organization. Uh, so we, you know, the network in Earth Island is really true. It's incredible. Um, we have people from the Borneo Project to the International Marine Mammal Project. Um, you know, we have topics ranging from like saving owls and, you know, to saving whales and dolphins. And it just, it really spans and it's really, really fun. Really, um, so the network is, is huge. And I'm, I'm really honored to have that, island and have that, have that network available and to be able to share it with everyone tonight is, is really an exciting thing. <laughs> Well, this is the first time that I've got to partner with you guys. So I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to hear this, the speakers tonight. It, and I had the privilege of uh, seeing um, Keiko with one of the trainers when they were in um, Oregon. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear about that whole process. And um, thank you guys for having me as your tech support. Tech support. So yeah. we're just about ready to start. We're so excited to have you here with us too, Brenda. Thank you for your help. Thank you. And do you want to go ahead and uh, remind everybody before we show the video how this is going to go tonight? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thank you everyone. Welcome. Thanks for coming to Orca Hour for Free Willy to Sea World. My name is Maddie Nathans. I am the social media coordinator at the International Marine Mammal Project of the Earth Island Institute, and I will be your host tonight. We're so excited to have you all here with us for our very first virtual event. Thank you all for taking an hour out of your days to join us for this educational hour on orca conservation and protection. We're thrilled to welcome two very important members of Earth Island Institute, Executive Director David Phillips and General Counsel Shimona Majumdar. But before we begin, there are a few things we'd like to we'd like you to keep in mind for the duration of this presentation. That being, so we don't have a chat window available for this presentation, but we do have a Q&A window. Um, in order to use the Q&A option, just click the Q&A at the bottom here, at the bottom of your screen, type the questions in there, and those questions will only be seen by the moderators and they'll be queued up for our Q&A at the end of this presentation. Before David begins telling us about Keiko's story, we're going to go on a trip <laughs> together with a legendary clip from Free Willy. Please draw.
Wow, what a clip that gives me some tears every time. Um, so thank you, Dave Phillips, for being here. Dave is the executive director of Earth Island Institute and the director of International Marine Mammal Project. He has been working for the protection of dolphins and whales for more than three decades. Dave led the effort to convince the worldwide tuna industry to cease sourcing tuna caught by the chasing and netting of dolphins. He also founded the Free Willy Keiko Foundation, which led the first ever rescue, rehab, and release of the orca whale Keiko back to his native waters. Dave is also on the board of directors for the Whale Sanctuary Project. Thanks so much for being here today, Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie. And thank you all for joining us online. I love that movie. Um, not just because it's well done, but because without that movie, there never would have been a Keiko release effort. It's really that simple. So I'm gonna give a bit of a way back tour of Keiko's journey and the blackfish phenomenon and what it means for the future efforts to end orca and dolphin captivity. And then our shining star attorney, Shimona, is gonna tell you about our lawsuit against SeaWorld and why it's important. And then we're gonna make time for answering your questions a lot have come in already, which is great. So buckle up because Keiko was a world traveler. So you might be asking yourself, did the Free Willy movie way back in 1993 really make a difference? Yes, it definitely did. So a couple years ago, I was at a conference with John Racanelli, director of the National Aquarium in Baltimore. And they've been a part of the captivity industry for decades with dolphin shows and small pools, the whole deal. But now they've decided to end all captive display and retire all eight dolphins to a seaside sanctuary that they're in the process of finding a location to and will build. This was really big news. And someone from the audience said to John Racanelli, what motivated you to make this change? And what he said was really interesting. He said, we have to meet our audience where they are. And our audience has grown up watching Free Willy, The Cove, and Blackfish. Those were the three things he cited. It was amazing to hear somebody from the captivity industry rec recognizing the value that these powerful films have had and the campaigns that went with them and the impacts they made. So when Free Willy was made, it was really a dark time for whales in captivity. SeaWorld was booming, a multi-billion dollar enterprise, pushing captures and trade and expansion of their captivity to places like Dubai and China. They really sold the big lie to the public that they were this wonderful ambassadors for orcas. And most people had no idea what kind of cruelty was behind their lives in captivity? There were fake education programs. They gave orcas drugs to calm them down. They gave orcas drugs to make them breed faster. Orcas sold for $5 million a piece or more. And there was little hope then for a captive whale ever being released back to the wild. There was no chance of retiring any to sea sanctuaries because there were no sea sanctuaries for orcas and dolphins. There was nothing stopping SeaWorld, or at least that's what they thought. First time I ever saw Keiko in Mexico City, it was a huge shock to me. He was in such a small tank. He barely had the room to turn around. He was thin and spent most of his time just floating up at the surface. And I had my doubts that he'd ever make it out of Mexico alive. And actually, you know what, he almost didn't. The water he was in was far too warm and he had this papilloma virus, especially under his pec fins. So there's one story that almost nobody knows about. After Free Willy came out, Keiko's owners and Warner, Warner Brothers, the makers of the film, they came under withering criticism 
for not doing something for the whale. The movie was all about what can be done for a friend. And here they were, and Keiko was still stuck in this tank and they weren't doing anything. So there was big pressure brewing around the world because he was already, Keiko was already the most famous work in the world at that time. So the owners in Mexico under that strain decided to offer Keiko to SeaWorld. Yep, they really did. And that would have been a really sad ending for Keiko's journey. But SeaWorld turned down the offer. They didn't want to risk their show animals getting the skin virus. They figured that Keiko would never make it out of Mexico. And it was just better to leave him there. But they figured wrong. So we turned the tables on them and convinced Reino Aventura, the owners of Keiko, to donate Keiko to the Free Willy Keiko Foundation. And we sealed a deal to bring him to a rescue rehab center where we could try to bring him back to health and hopefully one day give him a chance to go back to his home waters. So now the nonprofit organization, the Free Willy Keiko Foundation, not the captivity industry, would be in charge of Keiko's care and his future. So Keiko was really skinny when he arrived uh, in Oregon. And it was just, it, it was very clear that he needed a lot of help. So we, uh, we taught, we, we, we built this place at the Oregon Coast Aquarium where he could swim in cold seawater and recover and gain weight and not have to do any performances. And people could see him only through underwater windows. No stadium seating, no trainers riding on his back, none of that. And more than 3 million people came to see Keiko there. 3 million to see the rescue and rehab in action to learn about Keiko and learn about orcas and learn about their plight. In a lot of ways, this had become SeaWorld's worst nightmare. I heard later there was great internal feuding amongst them, criticizing each other for failing to take him on when they had the chance. Keiko did really well in Oregon. He put on 2,000 pounds of weight. He kicked the papilloma virus. He got way more active, way more fit. He met every challenge on a health basis. And it became clear to us that he was going to be ready for a next step. Now, the story of convincing Iceland, a whaling nation, <laughs> To let us bring Keiko back there is too long and gnarly to get into tonight. But in the end, we got the Icelandic prime minister to overrule his fisheries agency and allow us to bring Keiko home. This led to a lot, of, a year of preparatory work to be done by many, many people. We had to figure out the design and construction of a sea pen, how it could be anchored. It's all, of, all the ins and outs of going to Iceland, a very forbidding country weather-wise. But that all got done. And once then it became time to think about moving him home. There's only one aircraft in the world capable of taking off from a little airport in Newport, Oregon and flying nonstop, refueling in flight, and landing at a tiny airport off the coast of Iceland. And that was a US Air Force C-17 jet. And the Air Force thankfully agreed to fly Keiko home. I can tell you, it's pretty surreal to fly with a 10,000 pound whale. But Keiko was really calm. He was a lot calmer than the rest of us who were flying with him. So Keiko got to be in a first of its kind sea pen. And it was 
it was pretty large in and of itself. And it was a first of its kind. It was, it was really historic in a lot of ways. But in time, he was able to trans transition into the whole bay, a netted off bay. You can see in this picture how large the sea pen was and the bay, if you compare that to the tiny postage sized tank that he was in, it's just incomparable. So, and, and additionally, if you think about this, now looking at that bay, not with that sea pen's not there, but in that bay right now uh, is a beluga retirement sanctuary. It shows as an example, what kind of trailblazer Keiko was because now there's a retirement sanctuary there with two belugas that come from captivity in Shanghai, China. So we laid down a path that has allowed others to really keep pushing ahead on this effort to face, to retire and release uh, captive cetacean. Keiko continued to thrive and go even further, but nobody knew how he would react to the chance to be actually out in the company of wild orcas. So now you're gonna to get to see a rare short clip of Keiko swimming with wild whales. You're gonna hear the voices of Dr. Paul Spong and also the great Mark Berman. And this clip is from Teresa Demarest's documentary, Keiko, The Untold Story. And you can get a copy of the whole doc uh, from her site, which is keikotheuntoldstory.com. So let's cue this up. Looking at the uh, imagery from Iceland, that Keiko was interacting with other orcas that he encountered, uh, that he had achieved some level of comfort in doing that. So that was quite interesting to see that, that he finally was able to see his own species in his home water. That was incredible by itself. Oh, well, right behind him. Uh, it certainly seemed uh, that as time went on that he was becoming, in a sense, relatively comfortable uh, being in the presence of other walkers. He was totally free to do whatever he wanted to do. It was up to him whether he swam out and uh, or returned and so forth, although I have to say that humans were still a big part of his life at that point. Eventually, I think the plan uh, in Iceland was to leave him on his own more and more of the time. And that certainly, I think, was helpful, ultimately, to his ability to find uh, his own way. So, well, Keiko never did join up with his original family pod, but what an amazing odyssey he had from a tiny tank in Mexico to an amazing recovery in Oregon to a return to his native waters in Iceland, the first captive orca ever returned to his native waters. He was able to swim with wild whales and live out his life in the open ocean waters. And we're so proud to have given him the opportunity to do that. So one of the, one of the people on this webinar sent in a question that said, what did you think was the most important lesson learned from Keiko's journey? I think what we did best was to demonstrate that captive orcas and dolphins can live safely in seaside sanctuaries, and in many cases can be returned to the wild. The Keiko effort proved that there's not a single captive dolphin or orca in captivity now that would not do far better, be far safer, live longer if they were out of concrete tanks and in a seaside sanctuary. We proved that concept works and that's gonna help us in so many ways. Do we wish he'd found his family? Of course, but we were at a pretty big disadvantage there 
because the research data on wild pods of orcas in Iceland just was not there. If we'd been able to have a whale that was from the Pacific Northwest resident pods, it would have been a whole different picture because we know so much about every single member of those pods. But we didn't get it, we didn't get to choose which orca whale we got. We didn't get to choose which captive orca whale we got. It was it's turned out to be a, so difficult to find and break free any orca from captivity because they make so much money for the captivity facilities that hold them. So, so still, Keiko was a pioneer. He made it all the way to swimming with wild whales in his home waters. And along the way, he ignited a whole generation of young people. And he changed millions of people's views about how whales should be treated. It's a fantastic legacy. So meanwhile, in 2013, SeaWorld's narrative was just about to go from bad to worse. Blackfish took the whole issue to another level. Another person on the call on this uh, webinar sent in a question, what made Blackfish documentary so impactful? Well, for starters, it was seen by a hundred million people around the world. CNN, who had bought the TV rights, aired Blackfish hundreds of times. It pulled back the curtain on what lives of orca at, orcas at SeaWorld are like. It just shocked people. It made people rethink the fantasy that orcas love it at SeaWorld and love to have trainers riding on their backs. Blackfish crushed SeaWorld's attendance. It still has an impact today. It crushed their stock value. Most importantly, it put on full display SeaWorld's lies and deceptions. The whole underpinning of the captivity industry that SeaWorld has been ground zero in. They are the ones that created that imagery. So that effort to, that Blackfish did to put, uh, put SeaWorld's lies on display helped set the stage for our lawsuit that Shimona is going to tell you about shortly. So in the meantime, think, of, think for a moment about the <laughs> night and day differences between orca lives in captivity and their lives in the wild. Here's a short clip by long-term activist and filmmaker Stan Manassian. Orcas in concrete tanks live, sh live shortened, miserable, and bored lives doing tricks and shows for entertainment and profit. It's not natural or safe for trainers to ride on their backs like surfboards. Orcas' lives in captivity are really nothing more than a circus act. SeaWorld would have you believe that the orcas are happy and thriving, but scientific evidence shows that this is not true. Wild orcas live together in tight-knit family groups, societies. They work together to forage for food and raise their young. They have individual personalities and are self-aware. They have some of the largest, most complex brains on the planet and amazingly significant and sophisticated echolocation system. They roam the oceans over 50 miles a day. The females live 90 years or more. But in captivity, they're stripped from their families and their natural behaviors and have no semblance of real orca lives. So what does the future look like for getting whales and dolphins out of tanks? I think it's brighter than it's ever been. The world and the whole captivity industry is in a world of hurt right now. They've been forced to end orca breeding and imports and trade. Their financial picture is dire. The whole industry is so out of touch with changing public attitudes about exploiting whales for public amusement. 
And COVID-19 is rocking the future of stadiums and mass gatherings. Who wants to go and sit cheek to jowl in stadium seating? People from all around the world gathered tightly. It's hurting their attendance and it will continue to do so into the future. Europe is almost entirely out of the whale captivity business. Canada just passed a bill called the Free Willy Bill prohibiting any new facilities holding whales and dolphins. The beluga wang a sanctuary I mentioned earlier has sprouted up in Iceland. And the whale sanctuary project, which we're part of, is hard at work on plans for a sanctuary in Nova Scotia to accommodate belugas and orcas, be the first sanctuary in the world for orcas. Animal circuses have been driven to bankruptcy, Ringling Brothers, Etc. And if we can keep it up, these Sea World marine circuses should follow them there. So it's clear we've come a long way, but there's still a lot of work to do. And part of that is to continue to beat down Sea World's false narrative. It's really important work. So for that, let's switch over to Shimona and hear what it's like to go up against Sea World in court. Thanks so much, Dave. Looking forward to hearing more of your insights during the Q&A. Next, we have Shimona Majumdar. Shimona joined Earth Island as its first ever general counsel after having spent seven years enforcing federal environmental laws as a trial attorney with the US Department of Justice. While at Earth Island, she has significantly expanded its lit litigation docket, including a groundbreaking lawsuit to hold corporations accountable for plastic pollution. Shimona holds a JD from Georgetown University Law Center, obtained a BS from the School of Natural Resources and Environment at the University of Michigan, and served as an environment, environment sector Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco. Shimona is going to tell us all about the trials and tribulations of our Sea World lawsuit. Shimona? Thanks, Maddie, for the introduction. Um, as Maddie said, I will talk about our lawsuit, Anderson versus SeaWorld, which directly challenges SeaWorld on the false and misleading statements that they make to the public about the health and welfare of its orcas. But before I get into the details, I just want to set a little, provide a little bit of the context for the lawsuit. As you heard from Dave, um, Blackfish had a major impact on the public and led to a real sea change in public added about captivity of marine mammals and orcas and specifically. It also led to a suite of lawsuits against SeaWorld, ranging from class actions to investor lawsuits and even a criminal investigation by the United States Department of Justice, all based on the relations that were contained in Blackfish or based on SeaWorld's response to Blackfish and their efforts to induce the public to come back to visit SeaWorld and convince the public that everything in Blackfish was actually just a lie. So our loss our, our itself is California consumer protection and fair business practice laws. And these laws essentially prohibit companies from making false statements to induce consumers to purchase their products and they prohibit companies from engaging in fraudulent practices that would give them an unfair advantage over their competitors. So we felt that these, uh, these laws were a good fit given the fact that we were challenging SeaWorld's statements that they were making to the public. The three specific um, claims in our lawsuit are all derived from the false and misleading statements of SeaWorld about the health and welfare of their orcas. Uh, the first is we, we allege three violations of the California false advertising law, the California unfair competition law, and the Consumer Legal Remedies Act. Through these allegations, the lawsuit seeks um, various types of relief, but primarily it's that it re the, the seeking a court order that SeaWorld be required to issue corrective statements to the public in, that will allow the public to know the truth about the health and welfare of their orgas and refrain from making false statements in the future. In other words, SeaWorld tell the truth. It also seeks attorney's fees and restitution, which essentially is a reimbursement to the plaintiffs 
for the cost that they ex that they uh, bore by, by visiting SeaWorld, so the ticket or the purchase of an item. The lawsuit was filed in April on April 13, 2015, so now well over five years ago. It was filed in Superior Court of the state of California uh, for the city and county of San Francisco. Um, it was originally filed with the intent to be a class action lawsuit, but for various strategic reasons, as well as to avoid um, continued delay, we ultimately didn't seek certification of the class. And so the lawsuit is uh, brought by individuals. Um, and unfortunately, it was ultimately removed to federal court, which probably contributed in good part to some to the, de the delay. And this is a common practice, um, particularly when you're dealing with possible class action lawsuits or, and when you're dealing with private companies. So the lawsuit now is being heard in the Northern District of California at the Oakland uh, Courthouse by Judge White. And over the past five years, SeaWorld has spent many millions of dollars filing um, numerous motions in an effort to delay and stall this lawsuit from seeing the light of day. Um, over this period, we survived three motions to dismiss, a motion for summary judgment. Um, there was even a motion for sanctions filed against our outside counsel um, and a motion for judgment on the pleadings, which was essentially a last ditch effort by SeaWorld to avoid trying to be But because we were able to survive all of this, um, we ultimately did receive the green light to go to trial. Um, but in a last minute maneuver, SeaWorld did convince the judge to bifurcate the trial, which means that the trial was split into two phases. Um, with dealing with two distinct legal issues. The first issue being whether the plaintiffs have standing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then the second issue, if the plaintiffs do have standing, did SeaWorld lie? Um, now, the, as I mentioned, this lawsuit was, is being brought by um, individuals, and it's not, uh, it's not a class action lawsuit. And it's also not a lawsuit in which we, Earth Island, are a plaintiff. Um, rather, we've been consulting on this lawsuit from before its inception, um, the idea came through the International Marine Mammal Project. And, um, but unfortunately, because of the nature of the laws involved, uh, we couldn't be a plaintiff. We had to find individuals who had visited SeaWorld and who had relied on SeaWorld statements when they made the purchase um, either of a ticket or items at SeaWorld. So we were very fortunate to find two incredibly brave women who are serving as the individuals, uh, individual plaintiffs here, and they saw the conditions of the orcas at SeaWorld firsthand. The first is a, a mother um, living in San Diego, and she saw blackfish. Um, she was exposed to SeaWorld's campaign, subsequent campaign, to convince the public that blackfish was untrue and to essentially say to the public, give up, you know, they said to the public, give us another chance, let us show to you how well uh, we treat the orcas in our, in our, in captivity at SeaWorld. And she took them on their word and she went to SeaWorld with an open mind. And um, ultimately her conclusion was that SeaWorld, the, that the state, what, what she saw in Blackfish was in fact true and that SeaWorld was, was uh, selling a bill of goods and, um, and she decided to join the lawsuit to force SeaWorld to tell the truth. Uh, our second, the second plaintiff is a young woman here in the Bay Area who has a lifelong love of orcas um, and would love to eventually have a career that um, involves a, you know, working on behalf of protecting orcas. And with her family, she visited in 2012 and you know, she saw, of course, statements all over um, at SeaWorld about how happy and healthy their orcas are. And she actually, you know, she saw the performing orca show and subsequently, and, no and noticed that the dorsal fin was collapsed on the orca in the, um, in the show. And she subsequently asked the trainer, 
during one of the sort of Q and A's that happened um, after these uh, performances about the dorsal fin collapse. And the trainer told her that it was, you know, normal and something that happens, uh, it's equally common out in the wild. And Juliet took her on her word um, and she purchased uh, an orca, you know, stuffed animal um, to sort of commit, you know, to remember her time there. And then in 2013, she saw a blackfish and uh, equally felt, you know, she had been lied to and, um, and decided to join this lawsuit to hold SeaWorld accountable. Um, as I said, we are represented by outside counsel. In this case, we were able to uh, bring on the corporate law firm Covington and Burling, who they're headquartered in Washington, DC, but they have an office here in San Francisco. And they also, um, they do a lot of pro bono work and we are very fortunate to have been able to get a, a, such a large firm that has such, that has extensive resources to devote to pro bono because as I said, um, this lawsuit has already taken, has already been over going on for over five years and fighting a well-heeled company like SeaWorld requires a lot of time and money. Um, at, at this point, based on filings and what we know about the rates that attorney, the attorneys on both sides charge, um, we, we, we know that SeaWorld has spent upwards of about 10 million and our own team has spent upwards of 7 million. So it's no joke. It is not easy going up against these corporations and um, you really need to have, you know, you need to have a team that's committed for the long haul. Um, and fortunately we have that. Uh, our lead attorney is named Christine Haskett. She's a partner, you know, she, she's a litigator, but her specialty is in insurance. Um, similarly, you know, we have three primary associates on, although there have been many members it, rotating in and out over the years, but um, Lindsay Barnhart, Udit Sood, and Michael Bolas are currently the three who are uh, doing, doing most of the debate and are keeping the lawsuit going. All of them litigators, all of them primarily commercial litigation, patent, um, this type of work. So, you know, as you can see, this lawsuit is very different from the type, the subject matter that they would normally be doing um, in their practice, but they have devoted themselves to this effort and we are, we have just been so grateful to have their skills and knowledge and experience on our side. And uh, we feel very confident that we will be able to this case will continue to move forward and, and reach a successful result. Um, and so a little bit about, you know, where we are, as I said earlier, this was uh, split into two different phases. The first being whether the plaintiffs have standing under California law to pursue these claims. And that phase of trial has actually already occurred. It was right before the shelter in place order. Uh, it was March 9th to 11th. It was a bench trial, which means that there was no jury. It was just the judge. And essentially the plaintiffs had to prove through their testimony that they suffered an economic injury, which means they lost money or property in reliance on SeaWorld statements, that there's a threat of future harm. So this could happen again in the future. Um, and that, you know, if the judge gives them the release, the relief that they've asked for, you know, in this case, that SeaWorld start issuing uh, true statements um, and refrain from making false statements, that there's a possibility that they would go back to SeaWorld and, uh, down the road. And whether or not the plaintiffs are able to establish a standing really comes down to uh, their testimony and how credible the judge believe, uh, the, how credible the judge finds each of the plaintiffs. So um, the, they both went through long days on the stand where they both told their story and then were subject to questioning by um, SeaWorld attorneys. But ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, they, in, you know, in our view, they told a very compelling and accurate story that of, of their experience, but also of the experience of many people like them. Um, so we're, we feel confident and hopeful, but 
We don't have an opinion yet uh, from the judge and we don't yet know whether we're gonna proceed to the second phase of trial. Uh, if we do proceed to that second phase of trial, that will be really about whether SeaWorld told the truth um, to, to the, whether it told the truth to the public. Um, we do, it, although we don't know when it would occur, it would likely be a, a lengthy trial, a couple weeks, as there are a number of expert witnesses that would go on the stand, both experts on our behalf, as well as experts on behalf of SeaWorld, who would uh, set forth their opinions on the health and welfare of captive orcas, what captivity does, um, SeaWorld's practices, and then the judge would have to determine the credibility of these experts and whether their opinions support or contradict SeaWorld's statements to the public. Uh, so again, fingers crossed that we get there, but and we will certainly let, you know, issue press releases and let people know if we do. Um, but we just don't know yet. And with that, I am going to turn the mic back to Dave. Thank you, everybody. Dave, you're on mute. <laughs> There we go. All righty. So thank you. Um, so just a quick summary before we jump into questions. Uh, I think in the future, people are going to look back and wonder how it ever could be that we allowed capture and confining of orcas and dolphins to concrete tanks, these sentient and incredible dolphins and whales. It'll just be seen as a sad chapter that never should have happened. And you know, at, at one time, it could have been said that people didn't know better, but that can't be said now. We all do know better. So things are changing for the better. Public attitudes are changing and they're changing in our direction, but there's still lots to be done. And we really greatly appreciate all your support for the International Marine Mammal Project at Earth Island and encourage you to check out our website, for future updates on key campaigns. And we also want to thank all of you for all that what you're doing. Uh, there's still work to be done. I got a really quick short list of things in no particular order that I think people can do. Uh, and they're not, they're not rocket science, but they're just important. Let your friends know why not to go to parks and aquariums that hold dolphins and, and whales. whales. Help stop the import of captive beluga whales from Canada to Mystic Aquarium in Connecticut. To do this, email Mark Palmer on our staff and he can give you more ways to get involved. We're probably gonna be taking them to court. There's a whole coalition of environmental groups that are part of this, including Earth Island. Help this lawsuit. It's the only lawsuit going against SeaWorld. Help to hold them accountable in court. Support the initiatives to create the whale retirement sanctuaries. Check out the whale sanctuary projects key work of which we're a part to create the first ever whale sanctuary that can accommodate orcas and belugas in Nova Scotia. Check out their website to find ways that you can keep posted and help them. Help the efforts to stop all the whale and dolphin captures and slaughters in Japan. These are still fueling the Japanese and Chinese building of more captive parks. We've got to stop that. Help us keep the pressure on Russia to prevent further captures of orcas and belugas for sale to captivity parks. A, lot's, a lot of work's been done by people, Russian activists inside the country to try to stop it. It's still going to take more pressure. Help all the organizations that are fighting to protect the southern resident uh, orca populations in the Pacific Northwest. They're in such a desperate fight for survival and they need support and help. Learn about this, what scientists are finding out about orcas and their intelligence and their brains. Check out neuroscientist Dr. Lori Marino's work at the Kimmela Center for Animal Advocacy. And go see the splendor of whales and dolphins in their natural environment. 
with social distancing, not between just us and ourselves, but between us and them. So with that, those are just a few ways that you all can, can, can do things that make a big difference. So um, we still got time for some questions. So let's switch to Maddie and go from there. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Dave and Shimona. Thank you so much for your talks. Those were great. Now we have about 15 minutes to cover questions for those of you that submitted questions. Thank you so much. Just as disclosure, we may not get to answer all of them during this short 15 minute time frame. in which case we will follow up with all of your questions that we missed tonight in a sort of blog format after this event. So just look forward to a blog and perhaps even an email of your questions answered and, and they'll be, I promise they'll be very thorough and, and well thorough, yeah. So let's head on to the questions. First off, we have what role did kids play in making the effort for saving Keiko possible? So Dave, I think you might have the best answer for that. Yeah, well, that's, that's a good question. And it's really uh, been a key part of the whole effort. After Free Willy came out, uh, Warner Brothers got 50,000 letters from kids. And a whole bunch of basic, the basic thing they were saying is, you guys just made $100 million off this film. What are you going to do to save the whale? In the, in the movie, it jumps to freedom. In reality, it's sitting down in a tank. Keiko was on the cover of Life magazine. He was the most famous whale in the world. And the kids weren't buying it. They weren't buying that nothing could be done. So they motivated a whole lot of change. And I'll tell you, when Keiko left Mexico, there were throngs of kids weeping and they loved Keiko so much. And when he arrived in Orca, I mean, in Oregon, there were lines of kids waiting in the rain in Newport, Oregon, where it's always raining. And they were all waiting for Keiko. And when we landed in Iceland, again, a whaling nation, the kids of Iceland were, were, were on the cliffs and in the community and supportive. So they drove a lot of the effort to make this happen. I really don't think it would have happened without the kids because uh, most of us oldsters were of the view that we just didn't see how this could all happen. It was just too much money and too difficult. And how about the logistics and everything? There were lots of obstacles, but the kids weren't accepting that. And that made a huge difference. Absolutely. I think there's nothing more inspiring than the youth um, in taking on change. And, and that's such a beautiful thing that we've been able to see with Keiko and, and Free Willy. So, our second question is, can this lawsuit serve as a model to others concerned about animal welfare and captivity? Shimona? Yeah, I think that this lawsuit can serve um, a model for, for other organizations and individuals who want to address animal welfare and captivity. The, the beauty of this lawsuit is that it uses pretty novel legal theories in the fight against animal captivity. So instead of directly challenging the captivity itself um, under animal welfare laws or, or you know, similar types of statutes. This lawsuit really challenges the way that captivity is sold to the to consumers. And th that's what perpetuates the, you know, this, this demand to see animals perform or to see them, you know, live in these terrible conditions. Um, so that makes us different but it also makes it replicable. Um, and if you live in a state that has robust consumer protection laws uh, and unfair uh, and fair business practice laws like we do here in California, it's really a viable option worth considering. And you know, amusement parks like SeaWorld, um, they're required to be honest, just like every, uh, every other company that's doing business with us. So um, if, this truth comes out that will reduce demand and we'll see, uh, again, we'll continue to see this uh, effect of the truth dampening people's desire to attend places like SeaWorld. So um, I hope that, you know, as, as more people become aware of what we've been doing here in this lawsuit, that they, 
they try, they use similar efforts. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think such a big corporation like SeaWorld, you know, it's, it's no easy task to go up against. So I think like our work is, is definitely serves as a, as a great model for others. And hopefully that inspires some extra action there. So our next question is why aren't all captive orcas being released back into the wild? Dave, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> um, that's a good question. There are a couple answers. Uh, the first is that is greed because these Orcas are owned by, they're actually under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, actually officially not owned by the companies, but because they have gotten the permits and because they are keeping them in their facilities, they control them. They can sell them, they can buy them, they can trade them, uh, and they don't want to see them in the hands of groups that want to release them back to the wild or even to see them retired. Um, so we're at the mercy of that system until we can break free a whale like we did from Reno Aventura, which was a very unusual circumstance. It would be great if we could uh, get them to agree to release or to retire a whale. There'd be lots of individuals and groups who would help make that happen. And, but the companies, they won't do it. SeaWorld, is, it, it's so much against their narrative. Their narrative is, we are the ambassadors, we have the best interests of the whales at heart, and we think that, that anything else is scary and nasty, and we don't want to bring them back and put them in that dark old ocean, and so when we can have them in these sparkly waters. And so um, that's one. The other problem is that orcas, that, or, or dolphins too, if they're, if they're bred and born in captivity, they don't have the linkage to societies. They don't have the skills. They don't have the potential uh, in most people's mind to be released back to the wild. Now they could still live in a, a sanctuary for retirement for the rest of their lives and still have a way better quality of life even if they were born in captivity. But for a captive whale to get the permits for thinking about uh, releasing one that was born in captivity would probably not be a, a starter. So um, that those are the main reasons. It's mostly greed, and it's also the problem of the captive-born ones. Absolutely, I think there's a big difference between, you know, the orcas that are are captured and those that are born in captivity. And I think a lot of people have a hard time understanding as to why those that are born into captivity have a much harder time surviving in the wild. Okay, so next we have, what role did the Keiko Odyssey play in changing public attitudes about the captivity industry? Well, I think it's had a huge, a huge role. I think that uh, people are in an environment already where there's a lot of animal protection sentiment. So look what's happened at the circuses. Look what's happened to Ringling Brothers. There's generally a, tr a trend in favor of recognizing the rights of animals. But Keiko put a face on the ocean. Keiko put a face to that whole thing because he, he was able to be seen as an individual whale pioneering and his story became so popular across the oceans in so many countries that that, that changed people's views about the lives of captive orcas and what should happen. It was a very transformative event that came at a time in which society is already trans in that transformation. So uh, I think it, 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 we can't underestimate the role that Keiko played. I'm always amazed by how many people still remember Keiko, remember the stories. Uh, it, they, we get letters from people who've changed their lives because they've ended up going on to become a marine mammologist. I think even Shimona was actually someone influenced by Keiko in the early days and into a trajectory where her concern about the environment and getting involved with Earth Island 
Uh, I'm not saying that was the sole factor, but I think it was not, uh, not an insignificant part of it. And, and, and there are many people like that. We still get letters and we get, you know, we had an 800 number at the end of the film. This is back in 1993, an 800 number because there was no internet. And so that's how people would call to get information about what they could do for the world's whales and for Keiko. People still call that number now. Wow. They still call the 800 number now that was at the end of the Free Willy film. And it still rings to us. So it's like all these years later, the people are still watching the film. They're still seeing Keiko. They're still asking about him and what he meant. And it's, it's, it's quite a phenomenon. Yeah, absolutely. And I can speak to that. I, I, I'm in the office and I, we still receive almost one call or two calls every week. It's, it's really wild and really cool that people are still, still watching Free Willy and still <laughs> dialing up that number to find out what ha ever happened to the Free Willy whale and what happened with Keiko. So that's always really endearing. Thank you, Dave. And now we have next question. It has now been five years since the filing of the Anderson versus SeaWorld lawsuit. Is that normal? And when do you expect the judge's ruling on phase one? Well, nothing is normal these days. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is for sure. I would say that is not uncommon for a case to drag on for years, especially once it's been moved into federal court. Uh, things just move more slowly and there are not the same incentives in federal court as there are in state courts to get a case uh, to resolution. But five years is probably outside the average timeline for a case like this, where you have it's individuals versus one company as opposed to a class action or many defendants. Um, so I, you know, that's a a testament to SeaWorld's attorneys and their ability to just stall and delay. And, you know, and it shows how important it is to SeaWorld to prevent the truth from coming out and to keep all of this information under, uh, you know, outside of the public eye. Um, and of course now, you know, with this, our current um, public health crisis, it's really hard to know how quickly we will move from here. And similarly, it's hard to predict when we will have a ruling on the phase one trial. You know, when we first um, received the, the decision that this trial would be bifurcated, we thought for sure we would have um, an opinion at this, a decision at this point as to whether or not the plaintiffs have standing and that we would be looking at, you know, a trial this fall. But everything is really on pause and it's, you know, it's really unfortunate that we're going to just have to keep waiting and see what happens. Right. Right. I mean, I think everything, I think, you know, the, the pandemic has really put everything a little bit on, on edge and on hold. So, you know, it's, it's so hard to say with, with the lawsuit and, and the courts right now as to when things will progress. Um, Let's see. I think we might have one more time or time for one more quick question. Uh, although none of these answers I know can be very quick, but one sort of resounding question we've received is what can be done to help with the lawsuit? Um, so what can people do? What can folks watching right now? What can they do uh, to help us out? Uh, well, I mean, I think at this point, um, any, anybody who has access to, um, you know, to let let others know about this lawsuit and the work and and the work that we've done um, to make this lawsuit happen and to support um, the International Marine Mammal Protection Project um, and their uh, and you know their efforts um, on behalf of captive marine mammals. Um, is one thing people can do. Uh, pay, atten keep, pay attention to the news um, and follow IMPS um, blogs and uh, other public statements around this to stay informed about when the, the lawsuit will proceed. Um, and, you know, those are right now, at, those are really the main things that people can do to support the lawsuit. We're, we're waiting. Um, and yeah. Hopefully we'll continue to move forward, but we just don't know yet 
Absolutely. Dave, feel free to add anything else that you can think of. Yeah, I, I would just add that um, we've had some great help from individuals, scientists and others that have been critical. Ingrid Visser, uh, former trainers, people that have provided information to us about what's happening behind the scenes, showing the damages and, uh, and things when they're saying that uh, research wise that the fallen dorsal fins are the same as, as they are in the wild that are surfacing the scientific studies about it. Uh, so we have had a lot of help from uh, the community and from other scientists. So that's been super valuable. And if people have ideas or come, you know, uh, connections, that could all be helpful too. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dave and Shimona. It's been great to have you all tonight here tonight. Um, really great speeches or speak speaking. And, uh, you know, we saw some great footage tonight. Great Q and A. Um, Let's switch back over, Brenda, to the slides so I can thank all of our wonderful supporters and contributors. And there we go. So thank you everyone so much for tuning in with the International Marine Mammal Project of Earth Island Institute, to Institute tonight. Uh, it's been such a great evening. And so our team at IMMP would like to thank our speakers, of course, David Phillips and Shimona Majumdar of our Earth Island Institute, our event partner, Blue Endeavors, and Brenda Heckathorn for tech support, Teresa Demarest for footage from Keiko, the untold story of the Star of Free Willy, Stan Manazian for footage of Lolita and wild orcas, and of course, last but not least, the friends of IMMP and the orcas who helped prom promote this event. And if you're sitting there feeling like, oh, that was all so great, and you know, there's initiatives that are happening to help these orcas, but what can I do? Well, don't worry, you can donate uh, on our website, or you can follow this URL, bit.ly slash donate, I-M-M-P. You can, of course, visit our website, check out our current projects, sort of the latest news on marine mammals and their ocean environment at savedolphins.eii.org. And last but not least, please follow us on social media. It is such a help when you do this. Um, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram. If you just search the International Marine Mammal Project, we will pop up. And our logo, which you can see on the left here, will be our profile picture for all of those social media. So again, thank you so much. And thanks, Dave and Shimona, for being here with us. And we hope to see you all soon. Bye. <laughs>